Okay, we're now live on Facebook. So good evening, everyone. Good evening, IFNG. Good evening, my co-admins, Sir Jack, Sir Marvin, and our newly added administrator, Sir Manuel. So hi. 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 Good evening, Miss Gladys. Good evening, Sir Manuel. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Okay, Sir Marks, kindly introduce our lecturer for tonight. Okay, good evening everyone and we're lucky and we have a privilege to have another IELTS expert from IDP, Ms. Agnes Watanabe. She has a 30 years of experience as an IELTS expert. Without further ado, Ms. Agnes, you have the floor now, ma'am. Thank you very much and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming and joining the webinar tonight. So. Tonight, we will be talking about the IELTS test. And for those who might like to be able to have a better chance of getting a higher score. So the IELTS test, very quickly, because we, we don't have a lot of time to cover a lot of material. So basically, tonight's webinar will probably just cover some of the most important points. And if you would like to know more about the test, or if you would like to probably have a look at more details, then you could do it after the webinar. And good news to everyone, because there is a wealth of information out there on the internet. And so it, you just need a bit of patience and a bit of time and effort to look for additional materials. Okay, so very quickly, the IELTS test, the test which will determine whether or not you, the test taker, would be able to work or to study or migrate to an English speaking country. So it is not a pass or fail test. Nobody fails the IELTS. You just maybe are not able to achieve the band score that you would like to get. So the IELTS assesses the four language skills. And for everyone, all the participants, if you I'm sure that you all have an idea of what these four language skills are. So very quickly, if you could just maybe send your answers to me directly, if you can do that, or you can send it to, to everyone. Can you please type, what do you think are the four language skills that are being tested in the IELTS? I'm sure that you are all familiar with this. So just it, it's just good to review these things all right okay so i'm getting a lot of answers here thank you very much for taking part here and for trying thank you so it seems that everyone is already familiar with the four language skills that are being tested so we have that's right everyone all of you got the the answer correctly so you have listening reading writing and speaking so these are the four skills that will be assessed in the IELTS test and in the actual test itself. This is the order in which you will be tested. First, you have the listening, then you have the reading, and then you have the writing, and last is the speaking. So very quickly, let's go through the first, the first test, the listening test. The listening test consists of four parts. There will be 10 questions for each part. The thing to remember with the listening test is that you will get different kinds of question types. So it's, it depends on the kind of test you will get. Nobody's able to really know beforehand which kind of task you will receive. So the kinds of questions that you will most likely get would be multiple choice questions where you get to choose one answer out of four choices. You might get a matching type of question where you will be asked to match maybe the match column A with column B, or you might be given a map, a plan, or a diagram, which you would have to label based on the recording, or you might have to complete a form. The most challenging part of the listening test is that you get to hear the recording only once. So you might think, hmm, that sounds very difficult then. So that is why you need to practice first. You need to build up your skill on taking the test just as much as you need to build up your language skills. All right. 
And at the end of the listening test, you will have 10 minutes, 10 minutes to transfer whatever answers you might have written on another sheet of paper to the actual answer sheet. I hope that's clear so far, All right? So let's have a look at the points then, or the tips. How do you get through the listening test if you have only one chance to listen to the recording? So first one, always use your time to read the questions first. So the good news is that in every, during the first part of the listening test, you will be reminded that you have time to look over the questions before the recording is played. So use that time well. Read the questions so you have an idea of what kinds of topics you will be looking out for. You need to underline keywords so that you can focus on questions. So you only have, the, the listening test is, on, is on for only 30 minutes. So you would have a very limited amount of time to listen to things. So during that time, you really need to focus much of your energy and effort on listening to the recording and then trying to answer the questions. So it will help if you already know beforehand what to watch out for, what keywords you need to keep in mind so that you remember the topics. Then the third tip, you need to think of synonyms because on the listen, in the listening test, most likely, or chances are that the words you see on the question sheet will not be the actual words that you will hear on the recording. That is why it's the listening test, of course. Otherwise, it, it defeats the purpose if they will just keep repeating the same words. So instead, what might help you is to think of synonyms. If you think of the synonyms, or if you think of maybe phrases, which will mean the same thing, then it will enable you to predict what kind of content you would need to watch out for. Now, there's no trick in the IELTS. You're not going to be tricked by Cambridge or by IDP or the British Council. The questions will always follow the recording order. So you will not be going back and forth between the questions. Please be careful to stick to the word limit. What is the word limit? Why is there a word limit in the listening test? Because we've already established that you will get a variety of different questions. In some of those questions, you will have to write the answer. You will be given a word limit. So always read the instructions. The instructions are as much a part of the test as the actual recording itself or the actual test itself. So please stick to the word limit. Just because you write more words does not mean that you get a better chance of getting a correct answer. And intonation helps. I think maybe if you listen to the recording or to the conversation or the lecture, then you have an idea where is the question? Are there parts which are emphasized? Are there parts which do not seem to be very important? So this is where intonation would help. All right, so very, very quickly, I'm afraid, because then um, we don't have a lot of time left. Let's try to see how these tips are done in action. So we, let's try a couple of those tips. So underlining keywords. So for example, this, is, this was taken from an actual practice test. So this is part three of the listening test. So you have try to have a look at the questions there. There's one question. You have findings of previous research claim that personality traits of a child is likely to be affected by their position, right? So if this is the question on the question sheet, what are the likely keywords you think, words which will be important to you? So very quickly, again, so that it keeps you awake as well. Um, please, can you give it a try maybe? If you can send your answers on the chat box there, let's see which of these words would be important for you and which would help you while you're listening to the recording. So is what important? Is that a keyword? Would it be about? So there are probably three keywords from this one, All right? So please send your answers now. I'll give you 30 seconds. 
So please choose which words are important. Oh, come on, just give it a try. There are no right or wrong answers here, all right? So which keywords will help you focus, all right? Thank you. Someone has sent an answer. Okay, there are a few participants who have chosen to give it a try, all right? So if you were thinking of, so, um, okay, your answers look good. Thank you. Thank you for, for taking part in here. So you might have your own version of the keywords, which would be important for you, but these keywords as well might be helpful. Sorry, we seem to have. Okay, all right. Sorry about that. Okay, so these words, these underlined words might help you. So you need to listen to research, personality traits, and position. So just those three keywords, you can already establish the fact that you would be listening simply to personality traits and to position in the family, and it's based on research. So it might be a very long recording, but if it's not related to these three keywords, chances are you don't need that information. And so you need to just focus there. Okay, next tip. We said something about synonyms, sorry. So we said something about synonyms. So very quickly, we don't have time to go through all the letters here, but just letter A, for example. So you have six answers there. It says that you would need to choose one answer to, for one particular question. So how do you think of synonyms then? So for example, you have letter A. Do you think of, so chances are you will not hear outgoing in the recording. Neither will you hear selfish, nor independent or any of these personality traits. Instead, what you will hear will be synonyms or phrases, which mean the same thing, right? So you have for outgoing, you think of the synonyms there. So maybe you would be wait, you'd be watching out for words like friendly or sociable. So that might be in the recording, but you will never hear outgoing. So that is your clue. And then maybe for letter B, you have the word selfish, so maybe someone who doesn't want to share things with others, someone who just wants everything for himself or herself. So those phrases you might hear, but you will never hear selfish in the recording. But if you already have thought of these synonyms, then it will give you a better chance of answering the question in the listening test. Right, everyone? We move on to the next part of the test. Okay, so for the reading test now, let's move on to the reading test. This time the reading test consists of three sections. Three sections which might be different from each other. So you never really know how many questions there are in each section, but the total will be 40 questions. There will be three longish text materials, and these will be taken from journals, from books, magazines or newspapers. Once again, you will get a variety of questions. So you never know. So you need to be very careful. You need to check the instructions. You need to read carefully what you are supposed to do. So sample questions might be multiple choice or identifying the information, whether it's true, false, or not given. So always you in the reading test, what you need to think about is that it will all come from the material that will be on the test. You might have prior knowledge of the particular subject. If, for example, if you work in the medical field and it, the text, one of the texts was taken from the, one of the text samples was taken from a medical journal, then you say, ah, I have, I know these topics already. Yes. You might know about them, but be very careful and make sure that all your answers in the reading test will be based on what is written on the text and not based on what you know. Okay, so that's one tip maybe that you would like to think about. All right, so let's see, what are the tips then for the reading test? So again, it's very important. You always read the questions. And in the reading test is very important 
it's advised, but I think once you try and practice the IELTS test, you real, you realize that this is the only way to do it. You read the question first, and then you go back to the material. Because let's face it, the reading materials are very long, and chances are after you've read one paragraph, then you move on to the second paragraph, you'll forget what you read in the first paragraph. So it's not really of much use to you. Instead, it would be helpful if you read the questions first, then you know what to look out for or what to search for in the material itself. Then again, you need to underline the keywords. So keywords, um, these are words which will be of particular significance to you. It doesn't mean that it will be the same for everyone. So these keywords are words which will help you to look for the answers faster. So you need to make your own pattern. You need to establish your own strategy. It will not help if you just follow what others do. What would be better if you establish your own way? Like which keywords will help me look for the answer in the very long text? when you're only looking for one answer and at a limited time. Again, note the number of words allowed in your answer. So please read the instructions carefully. There will be words which you will not understand. That's true because they are all very long material, reading materials. Don't worry about that. If they are words which are very difficult to understand or very specific, to the topic, chances are you will not need it. If a word or a phenomenon or a process is explained to you carefully, then you think, ah, that might be part of the question. That's why they're taking the time to explain it. Now don't, of course, it's always good if you get each and each question and you try to spend equal time on each question, but if you're stuck, one question, it might be better if you have spent like a few seconds already and in a panic, you think, oh gosh, I don't, I can't see the answer. And then, so don't dwell on that. Instead, just try moving on to the next question. Chances are you might have time later on to go back to the question, but just do not spend too much time on one question. So much so that you don't have any time left for the remaining questions. And you only get one mark for each correct answer. There are no penalties for incorrect answers. What does that mean to you as a test taker? It just means that you give it your best. And if you're not very sure, just guess. Give an answer anyway. Because if, for example, there are four choices, then you, if you have to choose one answer, that means you have a 25% chance of getting it right, as opposed to zero if you don't really guess at all. Okay, so that's for the reading test. Very quickly, let's try to practice a couple of these tips on an actual test. Okay, so we have here keywords. So the first tip was to underline keywords. So again, let's have a look. This is taken from an actual practice test. So you have the nutmeg tree and fruit. So just, let's just look at question one, right? So we have there leaves of the tree and shape. So if you need to underline the keywords, maybe it will help you remember if you just think of leaves and shape, right? So with that thought in mind, you have leaves and shape, then go back to the text and then look for anything that will talk about leaves and shape in probably two or three sentences. So that is, so if you underline the keywords, then you can do, you can search for the answer probably faster and more accurately. And then the second tip was to note the number of words allowed. So have a look at those, for those words in bold letters choose one word only from the passage. So that's one word. So if it's two words, then you cannot use that. Chances are that's not the answer 
because the answer is supposed to be only one word. So you might think, oh, but wait, if I write two words, maybe I get a better chance of getting it right. But unfortunately, it will be marked wrong because the instructions were one word only. So if you think, but I need an article for this, right? I want to be correct. I want to be grammatically accurate. But it does say one word. So choose the, the best word that will fit the question. Right? So that's for the reading test. Now let's move on to the next test. And what is that? Still remember? It should be. And if Zoom will allow me to move on to the next part, okay, so that it's the writing test. So the writing test, it will be the last test, which will be part of the lump test that you need to take. So in the writing test, you will be given two tasks. One task, so of those two tasks, they will not have equal weight in, on your overall score. So most books or most websites will advise you to spend maybe about 20 minutes on task one. And in task one, you will be required to write 150 words. So spend a try when you are practicing for the writing test, maybe you can time yourself. Right? Remember, this is a time bound task. You're not given the whole day, unfortunately. It doesn't matter if you can write a perfect script or a perfect essay, but if it will take you longer than 20 minutes, then it might not give you, but you would, you would not have a chance of getting a good score. So try when you are practicing to always time yourself. So task one, what is task one anyway? So task one will usually give you diagrams or you will be presented with data. And of these many diagrams or charts or graphs or data, you would need to summarize the information and you need to summarize it using your own words as much as possible. So um, for those who are thinking that mm, 150 words, so maybe I can copy a lot from the question. Um, you can, but it might not help you get a better score. Instead, you don't really need to paraphrase everything, but for the most part, be careful to use your own words, right? So again, reminder, task one, as much as possible, spend only 20 minutes because you are only asked to write 150 words. Uh, so, so there might be some of you who will think, mm, 150 words, what if I write 200 or 250? Does that mean that I would get better score? It always depends on what you write. If you, what you write are not really relevant to the task, then unfortunately it will not really help you. So because you are advised to write 150 words, and remember they have pilot tested these questions on groups of test takers. So they know that as for the most part, you would be able to summarize the information, whatever data you would be presented with, in 150 words or a little bit more than that. So because the, you can think about, you know, over lengths or really long scripts, how about really short essays then? If I can write everything in 80 words and that's it, would that be okay? I've included all the information. Does that mean that I have a better chance of getting a good score? Um, well, they write, the, they give you a word limit for good reason, so that everyone would try, because this is a standardized test, they would like to see how well you perform and how well you are able to write based on the task that you're given. So you've paid for the test after all, so just try to write 150 words or a little bit more than that, but not too much, right? Remember, this is only a part of your score. Let's move on to task two then. Why is task two important as well? Now, again, 
there are two tasks, of course. So we talked about task one. In task two, you are you will be advised by many group, many books or many websites, and you will see for yourself as well why it would be a good idea to spend a bigger part of the test time on writing task two. So task two, you are advised to spend about 40 minutes because you are required to write at least 250 words. So task two then is slightly longer. What does that mean to you as a test taker? It means that most of your score will come from task two. So it, this is slightly more important. That doesn't mean task one is not important, but a bigger part of your score will come from task two. Well, it should. You're asked to write 250 words or more after all. And what is task two? So have a look at the description of task two there. So task two will usually give you a point of view, an argument, or a problem. And you would need to present a solution, or you might need to compare and contrast, and you would need to give your, your own opinion about these things. So again, there, there will be a, there's a wide variety of task two types, and there's no one simple answer or one single template that will enable you to answer adequately all the types of tasks. So what you need to do instead is to carefully concentrate on the task that you are given and then try to see how you will answer that carefully. If you read carefully the description of task two, you might be reminded of something. I'm sure that for all of you, this task two will remind you of all the essays you've had to write in university. I'm sure, chances are, not chances are, I am sure that all of you have had to write a lot of essays when you were in university. And so those essays that you wrote in the past will be very, very similar in format to task two. So that's good news for everyone because you've had good practice in doing task two already. I mean, you've had years and years of experience of writing essays after all. So task two should be quite, well, it should not be too much of a problem anymore, right? So again, question, if you are advised to write, or if the requirement is 250 words, would it help me if I write a very, very long essay? If I write 300 words or if, some people will probably, people who have a lot of opinions and a lot of supporting details, they might be able to write maybe 500 words or so. So does that mean they get better score than someone who wrote only 250 words? What do you think is the answer to that? I'm sure that you already know. I said that earlier and I'll say it again now. It will always depend on what you write. It does not matter if it's a grammatically perfect essay. If it does not answer the task, the question, then it might affect your chances of getting a good score or high score. Right? So always the most important thing to remember is you spend maybe just a little time considering the question first and then formulating your answer and making sure that your ideas are all relevant. Otherwise, if you include irrelevant things there, you would just have wasted your time. They would not affect your score. They would not help you in any way. All right, so remember task one, about 20 minutes, task two, about 40 minutes or even longer. So again, when you practice, time yourself. Try to make sure that you have a time, you have set yourself a time limit so that you would be replicating maybe the test conditions, test conditions on test on test day. Right? And always with task two, you spend more time on it than task one. I hope that's clear. So that's for the writing test. Now let's move on 
to the only part of the test which will be taken apart from the other skills. And that would be, I'm sure that most of you know this part. And if Zoom would only allow me to, okay, all right. So uh, before we move on to the speaking, to the next part, let's remember then the tips for the writing test. We've already talked about so many tips. So we'll just go through this very quickly instead. All right, so we have allocate your time properly. I think I've, <laughs> I have emphasized that in the first, with the first two tasks already. Then you decide, by the way, on your position, right? So where would position come in? Would it be task one or task two? Ask yourself, which of these tasks will require you to have a position or to have a view? It would be task two. So that is, you probably remember essays from your college days or from university. And you need to organize ideas into paragraphs. Now, this is one thing I think where Filipinos are, are have an advantage because um, Filipino as a language, you already have paragraphs. I think um, when you write an academic essay in Filipino or in whatever dialect, whatever is your first language, paragraphing is already important. However, there are languages out there which do not use paragraphs. So for those test takers, they actually find it very difficult to imagine what is a paragraph and why you should include paragraphs. So I think you, you will already have an advantage here. You know what is a paragraph and you know how to write a good paragraph, one with a clear focus. You need to use a range of vocabulary. So when you say range, then it does not mean that you try to put in as many like esoteric words or maybe words which you've never heard of before, but you thought like, oh, they're very long. They sound really good. I'm going to include it in my essay. Um, maybe a good guideline for you would be to remember vocabulary that would be relevant to the task. And sometimes, you know, you might not have a bit the kind of vocabulary that would be very specific to the subject, that is fine. I remember there was a Filipino author before and I can't remember his name, but he said like, um, use simple words well and use them, use simple words and write well, or something along those lines. I'm very sorry, I've forgotten. And someone mentioned, I, I read that in a book before, but I can't remember the exact saying. So you need to work with a, with a set of words which you know or which you are familiar with because you will need to write a long essay. So you would be able to talk about things in more detail if you are, if you're familiar with the words that you use and you know exactly what they mean. All right, so that's, that does not mean by the way, of course, that you do not try to improve your vocabulary by including words which you have learned from reading books. Of course you can do that, but always make sure that you're using them appropriately because sometimes the person, the reader will notice immediately certain words which come out there, which like certain words which do not really resemble the kind of level that was demonstrated in the other paragraphs. And you need to use a range of grammatical structures as well. The emphasis here is range, by the way, of grammatical structures. So um, because this is a writing test, you need to demonstrate the fact that you can write well and you can use a variety of structures. So if your essay, task one, tasks one and two, even if they're all grammatically accurate, but if they're all simple sentences, um, chances are that you might not be able to get a good score. So you need to demonstrate the fact that you can write or you can, yes, you can write accurately a range uh, using a range of grammatical structure. Some of them might not be exactly correct, but some of them might be, you never know. So again, practice, of course, practice is always important. So 
I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm very sorry. You might think, oh, she's repeating it again. Yes, because it's really important. You need to analyze the, ta the task and you need to write relevant content. So it's relevant because it's not, it doesn't matter how long your task is. If what you've written is not relevant, then it will not really help you at all. I think using linking words to connect and make your ideas fit or make it easier for the reader to follow whatever it is you're writing. I think this is something that, again, Filipinos um, have an advantage here because I think even in Filipino language or in other dialects, whatever your first language might be, you already use those linking words anyway, but you just, this, this time you just need to use the linking words which are in English, that's all. So it doesn't matter how many ideas you have, if you cannot sequence them well, or if you cannot present them in a manner which will make it easy for the reader to understand, then it will not help you. Right? Just, just try to imagine, for example, I'm sure that you all have extensive experience in the workplace. If you meet someone who is proposing, like someone who has a lot of good ideas, but the way that person presents the ideas is that they're all jumbled together. It's like 20 new ideas in like one sentence. So you cannot wrap your head around that one. And so all those 20 good ideas, unfortunately will not be probably given due notice. Nobody will really think about them carefully because they were not presented well. So think of it as like presentation. Once you present it well in a good paragraph, Use, you made use of the right linking words, at least, and then you connect them, then the reader will find it easier to understand whatever it is you're talking about. And do, please remember, this is a writing test. Um, do not write in note form. Do not use headings, bullet points, or numbers. So for example, in task one, do not label one paragraph, for example, as body or heading, and then conclusion. Do not write one paragraph and then write conclusion. Um, do not use bullet points either. Now, I've, I know several people are probably thinking, but you see, in the workplace, we use bullet points a lot in emails and in reports. It makes the report easier to understand, I know. Yes, it does make it easy, isn't it? It's like you have one bullet point and that's the thing that you need to focus on. But this is a writing test. So they would like the writer to demonstrate the fact that you can organize ideas. And so because you can organize your ideas well in proper paragraphs, you do not need to even label the paragraphs. Instead, the reader will understand that that paragraph is about this topic and the next one will be a different topic, All right? So please do not use note form or any kind of numbers or headings or bullet points. And at the end, give yourself maybe just a bit of time to look over what you've written. Chances are you might have missed something. So that, that's if you're taking the paper-based test. If it's the, the computer-based test, then maybe you need to write, look over at what you've typed Sometimes, you know, when you're typing really fast or when you're writing really fast, you miss out on some of the letters or some of the words there. So it always helps you. If you just give yourself just a few minutes even to just very carefully look through or go over what you've written. All right, so that's for the writing test. Now we'll move on to the last part. So how you, will you be scored, right? So very quickly. 25% of your score will come from task achievement. So how do you address the task? That is why I think I emphasized it so many times. You need to write relevant ideas. You need, you need to present relevant ideas. You need to answer the question. And then 25% will come from coherence and cohesion. So paragraphing, this is where paragraphing comes in. So see, this is a big advantage for the Filipinos, because that 25%, you should be able to get that well. I mean, you should be able to get that because you already know about paragraphs 
And then you just need to be a bit more careful with linking words, maybe. And then you have 25% lexical resource or vocabulary, the words that you use. Right? So again, you need to use a range, a range of words, a range of vocabulary. And the last part, grammatical range. So if you see that word here, the phrase grammatical range, it doesn't say grammar accuracy. It says grammatical range. So it's a range. You need to demonstrate a range and you need to demonstrate the fact that you can write them accurately. Okay. And now it's really the speaking test this time. So this is the only part of the test which you will be taking with an interviewer. So the speaking test is about 11 to 14 minutes. That's it. It won't be longer than that. And there are three parts there for the speaking test. So you will have part one will be mostly about introduction. It's about you, general questions about yourself. So that's part one. So part two will be a mini presentation. And I'm sure your teachers will help you out with this one. So you have to do a mini presentation, a very short one, but you will get, a you will get time to prepare for that. And that this is the only part of the speaking test where you will have time to prepare. In parts one and in part three, you will not, have, you will not be asked to prepare for anything. In part three, it's a very limited discussion. So if you see the pattern there, you have part one introduction, it's about you. And you have part two, which is a mini presentation. It might be about you and a little bit about the world. And in part three, this is where you need to think about concerns outside of yourself. So this time, it might be best if you can think of issues or concerns outside of your own interests. So this is not about you anymore. It's about perhaps like a, a bigger group of people, perhaps like, a group of Filipinos or your country or Southeast Asian countries, but bigger groups in general, not you anymore. So please bear that in mind when you're taking the speaking test. And also please remember, whoever is interviewing you is also doing his or her job. So whatever that person is doing, that person is doing it for a very good reason. There's a very good reason for doing that. So try not to work against that person. Just think he or he, she is doing her job, his or her job, and I'm going to do mine. And my job is to do well in this test. So just know that both of you will be working towards a common goal, which is basically to get through the test. That person will help, will try to get the best speaking sample from you. That is why they're, that person might ask you questions or do things which you think might like might throw you off sometimes but always remember that person is just trying to get the best speaking sample from you otherwise that person will not be doing a good job please remember that so let's see what are the tips then for the speaking test so because it's a speaking test um, chances are that you really need to be prepared for it. So nobody takes the IELTS or a, la a language test such as the IELTS after having learned the language in just two weeks. Usually like most of you, you would have spent years trying to learn the language. So hopefully you are already able to listen, to read and think in English. You need to talk at a steady rate or you just, speak the way you normally would. It's not a contest here. You, just because you say a lot does not mean that you get a better score. And anyway, if you speak too fast, chances are the listener will find it difficult to understand what you're saying. Try not to speak too fast, but try not to speak too slow as either. If you speak too slow, it might be very difficult for the listener to understand you. So just use the, speak at a normal rate, right? How you would normally speak. Listen to yourself when you speak in your first language or in another language. 
then chances are you, that should that would be the same rate that you would use when you speak in English. And if Zoom would just allow me, okay, that's it. There's the next tip. So in part two, the only part where you get to prepare, use that time to make notes. Of course, chances are that, you know, there will be subjects or topics which you're not very familiar with. So if that happens, the interview will understand if you need a few seconds to think about your answer, of course. Right? Sometimes, you know, you get thrown a question which you have never thought about. And so you kind of think, oh, hmm, let me see. So you will need a little bit of time. But of course, you must remember this is a time bound test. You only have 14 minutes to do the test and whoever is interviewing you is tasked to make sure that it's a 14 minute interview test or 11 to 14 minutes, that's all. If it's a longer speaking test, then that would render the interview slightly not the same with others, which would be unfair for the other test takers. So that's why you need to remember as well, it's a time bound test. So try, I think what would help you most would be if you already, if you try to read about certain issues in your spare time, so that you would have ideas about certain issues already. And well, I think this is self-evident. You need to use stress and intonation. Try to listen to yourself when you, when you use your first language, if it's Filipino or, any other first language or second language that you have, you always use stress. And there will be a certain kind of intonation. And that would be the same in English as well. And maybe you might make a few gra grammar mistakes. It, you know, it happens, especially if you're, because there's a certain amount of time pressure, there's a certain amount of pressure as well on yourself because you'd like to do well. If you make a mistake, mm -hmm. Just don't dwell on it. The most important thing is to move on so that you can do better in the next few questions because that is your chance of repairing whatever it is, whatever mistake you might have made or error you might have made earlier. But it's, it's really just natural. Be gentle on yourself and just remember, continually move on, that's all. So again, I think if we've talked about this already, you need to give more details. So usually in the speaking test, when you're asked a question, don't give a long grocery list of things. Like you need to, even if you only have a few points to talk about, but if you can give more details, then that would be more than enough. In fact, that would be great. You need to explain your answer. So, of course, this is the speaking test. So if you can, if you don't explain your answers, what kind of speaking sample would you be giving to the interviewer? So try to explain your answers by giving reasons. But remember as well that, you know, you will be asked um, a variety of questions. So um, you can't really expound for a full five minutes on a single question. And maybe you can, but then that would mean that your sample is very limited. It's only that particular topic, right? So that is why you will be asked uh, uh, different questions. And if Zoom would allow me to move on, okay. Then part th in part three, you might be given different sides to question. Um, it says here, weigh up both sides. It's a good idea. That's one way of going about it. Yes, when you answer, you can weigh up both sides and then give examples to support your ideas. Or, you know, if you're, if you just really cannot think of anything, um, if you can't think of a, a lot of ideas to support your answer and you can only think of one side of the question, that is still fine, All right? So, you know, be, just try to answer each question to the best of your ability and give support, um, give examples to support your answers or reasons, reasons, reasons or examples. 
Now, work and study questions. I think if you go on the internet, as I'm sure all of you have already, you will see a lot of different samples out there. And so you will probably rehearse it in your free time. Uh, you will rehearse it to death sometimes. So you, you sound like you're giving a speech when you're doing the test itself. So um, maybe you can just try to make it sound just a bit more natural, right? But, you know, um, I admire people who make the effort of really studying very well for the test. And I don't see really anything wrong with preparing or rehearsing work or study questions before the test. So sometimes you will be asked for your opinion. So you need to present your opinion. You can say in my view, as far as I'm concerned. So there are a variety of ways. So in your spare time, maybe you can practice or you can read books and see, are there other ways of letting me present my opinion? And the, the, uh, there will be a list of IELTS topics which will be available on the internet. You know that. The IELTS will not ask you questions which are very specific to a course or a major. They will not ask you about um, differential, equa differential equations, or they will not ask you to, to summarize Krebs cycle in two sentences. So there will always be a set of IELTS topics which have been used over and over, and over again. So try to look through lists of those on the internet or in books, and then try to practice. So how you will be scored for the speaking. So one fourth of the score will be fluency. If you are able to speak continuously, there will be pauses maybe, but not really long pauses because you do have to think of an answer. Then lex again, another one fourth will be 25% will be lexical resource or vocabulary or how correct or accurate your vocabulary is and then you have again it's still grammatical range and accuracy so always that there's that word range All right so i only have a few minutes left so don't worry i'll be wrapping things up very soon and then you have the last part which is pronunciation so question i i don't have a standard native english pronunciation i don't have an american accent i don't have british accent does that mean that I don't have a chance of getting a good score? Pronunciation is mostly linked to, to how the listener is able to understand you. Now, remember, there are native speakers out there. I'm sure that you might have met them in, in the workplace. Native speakers out there with pronunciation, um, with very, whose pronunciations are very difficult to understand, even though English is their first language. So. Pronunciation is more like how easy is it for the listener to understand what you are saying? So that is pronunciation. All right, so just to summarize. So you make an opportunity, then you set targets. What are you supposed to achieve while you're preparing for the test? Of course, you need to make sure that you're, you are taking the correct test. There are two kinds of IELTS. You have academic or general training. Please try to consult IDP or your teachers to make sure that you are going to take the correct test. You already know how you will be scored. Now, IELTS is one of those tests. Um, you know, one of the hallmarks of a good language test is that you know how you will be assessed. And the IELTS has Cambridge has been very good on this. They've been very clear on what kinds of things you need to remember and or, or what kinds of things you need to achieve to get a certain kind of score. You can see it all and they're all out there in public. You will see the descriptors and you will see samples out there. So it's a very good test in that there's no magic involved. There's no like, um, you know, you, you, it's not asking you to guess as to how you will be assessed. They will give you very clear guidelines on how you will be able to achieve a certain score. And remember that preparation courses are mostly about how to take the test, which is what basically this webinar was all about, because it is assumed that you would have spent years already prepare or 
improving your language skills or you would have spent years already trying to speak English or use English or write in English in the workplace or in your daily life. So every day counts towards um, language. It just means basically that every day is a chance for you to practice your language skills. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, we will try to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. But for the moment, let me turn you over to Laurie. Hi, Laurie. Hi, Lori. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I think she has no okay, audio. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, right. That, that wasn't Lori. Sorry. Hi, Lori. Can anyone hear Lori? No, I think yes. she's muted. Don't have any audio. Miss Lorraine? You have no audio, Paul. Um, let me see. Hello, oh, this one. There you go. Okay. So I decided not to use my headphones anymore. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you, Miss Agnes, and good evening, everyone. So, yes, my name is Lorraine, Laurie from IDP IELTS, and I am the test center administrator for IDP Philippines, IDP PH009, and our test center is in Manila, right? So I, I would only like to share with you some of the value-added services that you can get if you will book your examination with IDP. So I'll just share my screen, Ms. Agnes. Is it okay? Yes, sorry. Can you? Oh, yes, you're the co-host. Yes, correct. Yes, there you go. All right, can everyone see my screen now? Yes, we can see. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry I'm in Kabinatuan for an examination now. And Fortunately, the internet connection is not that great, but hopefully we can, yeah, I can share with you um, the services that we provide our test takers if they book their examinations with um, IDP. So first of all, IDP is known for um, conducting the examination in different parts of the country. So here in the Philippines, we have at least 30 test locations. So these are the locations that you can choose from. So we bring the examination, the test closer to those who need it. So our um, office is in Pasig. It's in Marco Polo, Sapphire Road, Pasig City. So in our office, we conduct um, the computer-delivered IELTS. Same with our others, uh, other office, which is in Cebu, Keppel Center. So we also conduct the computer-delivered IELTS there. And also we have a test center in Baguio for the CDILs. So if you would like to take your examination on paper or on the computer, you have these options and you can take it when, wherever and whenever you want. So the computer delivered IELTS is offered daily in Manila. We, we have two sessions every day. While in Cebu, we have Wednesdays up until Sundays. And in Baguio, we offer the computer delivered IELTS um, Fridays and Saturdays. Right. So the other locations here that you see, the 30 locations that we have, we have the paper-based test. So if you have questions about the difference of the paper-based IELTS and the computer-delivered IELTS, we can answer them later. All right. So first of all, um, one of the advantages of taking the computer-delivered IELTS is probably you getting the results faster. Now for paper-based IELTS, results are released in 13 calendar days. Whereas if you will take the computer delivered IELTS, results are released in three to five days. So if you have a pending application or if you need to submit your scores to any academic institution, you may opt for the computer delivered IELTS. Also, the computer delivered IELTS is offered um, for the UK VI. So there's a difference um, the standard IELTS, or if you're bound for countries such as Canada, US, New Zealand, Australia, they do not require UKVI. But if you're bound for UK, you need to check with your visa officer if they will require you to take um, IELTS for UKVI. So it's available on computer and on paper. So 
So these are the uh, exclusive things that you have to or you must enjoy if you registered under IDP. So first is um, our wireless headphones for the listening test. So IDP uses the wireless headphones not just for um, the computer delivered IELTS, but we also have it available for our paper-based examinations. So if you want clarity or isolation, if you want to listen to the audio um, all by yourself, you may use, um, you may enjoy the use of our wireless headphones for the listening test. So please note that these headphones are available in our Luzon venues okay, and in our Cebu or Visayas examinations. So hopefully we can also bring these wireless headphones to um, Mindanao. Who knows? So we will be able to also offer this freely to our um, test takers down south. And also, if you will register with IDP, you can enjoy a lot of webinars available for you. Some of them are actually posted on our Facebook page and are being delivered by our head office in Australia. But we also conduct um, our own webinar here in Southeast Asia and also in the Philippines. And once you register with us, we'll start giving you all the links so that you can participate and also ask questions like this um, to our IELTS experts as well. So at the comfort of your home, wherever you are, using your computer or your cell phone, you can prepare for the IELTS. As highlighted by Ms. Agnes a while ago, preparation is very, very essential when it comes to taking the IELTS. Also, um, you will have um, the chance to enjoy or at least prepare um, using our uh, Macquarie preparation tool. So um, it's actually some if you want to purchase uh, this preparation tool. It's kind of expensive and it's also available in Australia. But if you will register with IDP, you have the option to enjoy um, reviewing or pre um, preparing for all four skills and you will have access for 14 days. Or if you want to focus on just one um, skill, you can um, visit it and also prepare for your examination for 30 days. So if you want to know more about it, um, just send us a message. I'll give you our email address later on. And yeah, this is done online. So whenever and wherever you want, you can prepare for the IELTS. Okay, another thing is that IDP offers the free SMS sending of results. So some test takers, they want to know um, their scores immediately on the day results are released. So I mentioned about 13 days um, release of results. So this SMS sending of results um, it's available for our paper-based paper test takers. Unfortunately, for the computer delivered, since it's three to five days, you can easily go to our office and claim your results. But for um, our paper-based test takers who have to wait for 13 calendar days, they want to know their results immediately. So they just need to sign up for it, give us um, your preferred mobile number, and yeah, we will send the results um, 13 calendar days after your examination. So just note that um, the SMS results and even online results, because you can view them online as well, are only provisional scores, which means you still have to wait for the hard copy before you make decisions on sending your results to any um, institution. Okay. And also, if you want um, to avail of our writing in hands, it's only 1,500 pesos. So what will happen is that we will give you a prompt and you will respond and email us your scripts and you will get personalized feedback on your writing tasks from our um, IELTS experts as well. So actually tonight, we'll be giving away three um, free slots for this writing in hands. So, um, we'll just get in touch. So we, some of our uh, participants are actually, I, I have their email addresses and we'll send you an email to give you, um, to give you the procedure and how you can enjoy this writing in hand. So we'll pick five participants from this session. We'll get in touch with you through email and we'll give you the link or all the questions that you have to respond to and enjoy getting personalized feedback on your writing samples um, starting next week when I get back to the office. So yeah, we'll get in touch with five participants from this webinar. 
right? And if you have other questions, you can visit our website, idp.com, and also our Facebook page. And also send us an email, ielts.philippines at idp.com. And yeah, we'll respond to you as soon as we can. Right. So I want to spend more time responding to your questions. So if you have any questions about IELTS or test administration, we are here to yeah, answer them. Ms. Doreen, I think there's a question from Erica Gabriel. Erica Gabriel. Mm -hmm. uh, she said, hi, do you have any mock test recommendation for computer-delivered IELTS? Thank you. So um, for now, all test preparations are done online. We have one available um, on our Facebook page, all right? And also, when you register uh, your examination with IDP, you will be provided with links. So within the preparation for the computer-delivered IELTS and actually the paper-based IELTS are almost the same because you are being marked in the same way, same scoring system, same level of difficulty, same sets of questions being asked. So I think, uh, yeah, all of these are going to be presented to you or given to you if you register your examination with IDP. But if you want to try it out, please visit idp.com for a sample uh, mock test. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't see um, all the questions. Thank you. Right. So that is, is that the only question that we Thank you, Erica. Yes, as of now. Oh, from Abigail. Is there any mock speaking test to IELTS expert before the exam? Um, we do not have um, the mock speaking tests to IELTS experts. And, uh, but then if you want to avail of that, I think that's going to be available with the Macquarie online preparation tool. But if it's just similar to you like being in a Zoom meeting with an IELTS expert, Fortunately, we don't have that yet. So if you want um, the Macquarie preparation tool, it's available for 30 days and just choose the speaking component of the test. Okay, so from Lawrence Mejia, when would be the scheduled exam for November and December here in the Gupan? Thank you so much. All right, so I need to uh, escape from this one. I need to check our um, online registration site. But you may visit www.ielsregistration.com to see all the tests that we have available for the group one and also nearby test locations. So you see, we do not, unfortunately, we don't go to the group one every month. I think it's every other month. So if you have other options, if you really need to take the examination, then you have other options, probably Kampanga, uh, so please visit ielsregistration.com for all the test dates that we have. Okay, so there's a question from Maureen, Maureen Guinano from Facebook. What's the difference between academic and general IELTS? So I guess you want to answer that? <laughs> Hi, good evening. Yes, um, sorry, who, who asked the question? Uh, Maureen from Facebook. Maureen. Hi, Maureen. Um, the, the differences between general uh, and academic. Uh, so for the G general training test, they're usually for people who would like to migrate to, an, to a country where English is a native language. So these will probably most likely be advised by um, if they go to an immigration counselor, they will be asked like, this is the kind of test that you are supposed to take. And so um, the academic test is usually for those who would like to work in another country or who would like to, most especially for those who would like to go to a, to a school in a country where English is the native language. There are slight differences there. I think the, the questions for the writing tests will be different. You will get different types of writing tests and then you will, the speaking test will be the same. It will not matter whether you get the academic module or you get the general training module. I hope that answers your question. 
So if in doubt, you need to check first with IDP or with the institution that you would like to go to or to the country that you would like to go to or to the place where you would like to work in. What kind of IELTS tests are you or results are you looking for? I hope That's that right. answers your question. Right. Okay. So for your last question from Elite She She Zayz. Hi, ma'am. Question lang po. Nakabu ako for CB in IDP. Clarification lang po in writing and reading. It is okay to write down the answer in caps lock. Thank you. Well. Actually, that has been a, um, a question ever since I joined IDP. That has been one of the uh, usual questions that stakers would ask. Um, it really You won't be rated if you will type all your answers in all capital letters. Okay? But you just have to be uh, very, very careful with um, punctuations. I have heard other IELTS experts um, say this as well. So there, you won't be graded against um, using capital letters all throughout your writing test. But you just have to be very, very careful using punctuations as well. Okay. Any tips on this, um, Agnes? Oh, yes. Um, well, yes, as what Laurie has said, you, you need to be careful with punctuation. And because this is a writing test, then you need to demonstrate the fact that you know which are proper nouns and which are not proper nouns. So proper nouns, you capitalize the first letter of the word, or if they're not proper nouns, or if they're not names of, that need to be capitalized, then, well, you need to demonstrate that ability. So you wouldn't be able to do that if you use all caps lock. That's all. And um, um, and for, I'm not sure about the, the reading part, though. Very sorry about that. But I think that would matter as well if you think about it. If the question is about the name of a place, then of course you capitalize the first letter. It's, it's different if you give the name of the place starting with a small letter or if you start it with a capital letter or if it's just the name of an object, then it will, it will not really matter whether you write all, um, you start with, but it, it, if you write or if you start your your word or your answer in a small letter, then it's the name of an object and, and, or something along those lines. I think that that's my take on that. But definitely for writing, it, it might matter. All right, so, hmm, okay. There are two questions. So uh, first one is from Karen. Is there a paper during listening test for CD in IDP for notes? So when you take the computer-delivered IELTS, you have to log in with um, your personal details, okay? And these personal details are given to you in a sheet of paper, an A4 paper. And you can use that sheet of paper to write down notes for uh, the listening test. So yes, you are given an A4 sheet of paper for writing down your notes. Okay, okay for our last question for tonight. So from Lawrence. Hi, ma'am. One more question for the requirement before taking the exam. Do you require RT-PCR tests for the examiners or examinees? Okay, maybe examinees, right? Um, we do not require, uh, it's not a requirement for you to be able to book an examination with IDP. But I just want to let you know that there are hotels, because we conduct, especially the paper-based examinations, we conduct them in ho in hotels. For example, here in Cabanatuan, La Parilla Hotel requires all people who would get inside um, to present or to check in vaccination part. So it really depends on the hotel. But you will not be required to submit an RT-PCR test prior to um, you taking the examination listening, reading, or speaking tests. But we will definitely let you know if the venue, the hotel partner that we have, will require vaccination card. Or if you don't have that, because there's also an option for you to present the birth certificate. Uh, it's from the barangay, and it states that you're not a COVID positive or you've never been um, a COVID positive patient or probably antigen or RT-PCR. But yeah, it's not really a requirement for you to book the examination. OK. 
Okay, I think that's it. Okay, so, Sir Manuel. All right, thank you everybody for attending. Um, I'd like to thank Ms. Agnes and Ms. Lorraine, especially IDP Philippines for gracing us with their presence. And I can see a lot of people are committed in getting their desired band scores. And just keep working hard and I'm sure, every, and studying smart, and I'm sure everybody will ace this exam, right? And I'm excited to interview all of you after the exam as well. <laughs> thank you, IDP Philippines, and thank you for our audience members. All right, thank you everyone. So I think let's call it a night. So on behalf of IFNG, Sir Marvin, Sir Manuel, Sir Jeff, and Miss Laurie and Miss Agnes, thank you very much for giving us your time and lecture. It is indeed informative lecture for our uh, members. So we are looking forward for another fun-filled lecture with you. See you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much, Bye. everyone. Keep thank safe. you. Thank you.